Amen, amen. Thank you, Keith, for inspiring us. God's eye is on the sparrow. Every so often we forget that. Every so often we need to remember. Regardless what's going on in our lives, regardless what challenges we face, no matter how good or how bad times are, his eyes on the sparrow and you can rest assured he's watching over. Praise the Lord. I want to thank our praise team, our worship leaders, all who participated in this morning's worship experience. I want to thank you for involving yourself and in leading us into positive worship, our musicians included. Uh, you make worship here at Stone Mountain Seventh Adventist Church very special. So we thank you for what you do. Um, it's pretty hard not to acknowledge our um, Young at Heart group over here. With, with the, is that lime green? That's that. You're, you're standing out even when you're sitting down. So, <laughs> so uh, our 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 group of wisdom. That's it. Yes, that's the wisdom club. Now, I understand you have to reach a certain birthday to belong to them, and uh, it's possible one day I will. But uh, we thank you for representing and. If you are of that certain birthday, if you're at least half a century old, is that the right way to say it? Half a century? Yeah. If, if you've made that half century mark, then you want to get yourself one of those bright lime green tops because these guys do a lot of stuff together, a lot of social events, and they don't invite me. But uh, I know a few times a year they go out and they spend some good fellowship time together and we're glad to have that group. So if, uh, if you haven't been getting out lately and you're above that 50th birthday mark, see, uh, where's Audrey? Audrey Wave, there's Audrey, there's Vilma, Vilma Wave, and they'll get you on the inside. All right. Um, I guess our youth department wants us to remember the two o'clock lupus walk this afternoon. For those of you that plan on participating in the lupus walk, see our youth director, Larry Nichols. I'm sure he's in here somewhere, unless he's taking care of one of the kids. But uh, if you had plans to be part of the lupus walk, make sure you do that this afternoon. We continue in our sermon series today. And if you've been here more than twice, you know that we're in a sermon series entitled Lessons Along the Way. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for keeping up. It just gives me the warm fuzzies when I can give myself the impression that somebody's listening. So thank you. Thank you. Lessons Along the Way. And our lessons this quarter are coming from the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. We're going to cover one or two from 1 Samuel but during the time of the judges. Um, and it's, we're, we're glad that uh, we're all following. Now, as I start every sermon, there's something I'm supposed to do, right? I'm supposed to make the appeal right up front. I don't want to forget it at the end. I make the appeal right up front. Our appeal week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, is for all of us to be engaged in reading the Word of God every day. Can, can we do that? Can, can we make it our practice to read the Word of God every day? How many are doing that so far? Let me see your hands. Or like, hey, let me see a few more hands. Okay, tell the truth now. All right. I invite you, if you don't have a devotional daily Bible, procure one for yourself. We may still have some in stock. If we don't, we do. We do have some in stock. But should we not, by the time you request one, we will order more. Why? Because we want you to be in the Word of God every day. That's what makes the difference in your life. When God is shaping us every day, then he's forming us into his character. Living on one sermon, two sermons, four sermons a week uh, is not equivalent to spending that quality one-on-one -on -one time with God. So we want to make sure you do that. And of course, Wednesday nights, we come together and review what we have read for the week. So uh, if you're interested in joining us Wednesday night, Get some feedback, bounce back from uh, what you've read during the week in your devotional daily Bible. You're invited to be here with us. Let's just pause for a quick word of prayer. 
as we get into the word. Father, you have blessed through your word this week. I've been blessed in processing it. Now bless your children uh, that they may feel closer to you, that they may appreciate you more and make good decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. I lived in South Florida for about 24 years, give or take, and uh, getting to South Florida was an adjustment for me as I had lived in Boston and New York before that, but I, I realized that I was really in another country. They just use American currency. Um, the further into Florida you go, the further into Southeast Florida you go, the, the more you realize you're, you're not in the U.S. Even the architecture is different. The culture is different. I went to a Chinese restaurant in, in South Florida, and uh, presuming all the folk working there were Chinese, it kind of did uh, get my attention when even the uh, Asian employees at the Chinese restaurant were speaking Spanish. I was at another event, and, uh, you know, I, I saw an individual that I would assume was a good old southern boy uh, with his big old cowboy belt and the pointy uh, leather boots, gator skin boots, and uh, he was speaking Spanish. People who looked like me were speaking Spanish. Everybody's speaking Spanish in South Florida. That's when I realized, I'm not sure this is quite the U.S., but, you know, as long as they let me in, I'm okay with it because the weather is wonderful. But uh, as I was there, you know, you, you meet enough folk, and of course there's a, a, a large Cuban population, uh, um, call it almost a refugee population in, in South Florida, and you get to hear a lot of stories about uh, coming over from Cuba. A lot came when they were very small, their parents brought them in the late 50s or 60s, but there are still a lot of people that came during the 80s, during the boat lifts. And I had a church member um, who came on a raft all by himself, spending days out in the ocean, dehydrating, just hoping and praying that he would make it to the United States, and he did, and settled down, and, um, you know, life goes on. Um, but one day I was connected to an individual, a friend of a friend. I was doing some work, needed some help, and uh, got this guy to me. And the individual was actually visiting South Florida from Cuba. And I figured, well, you are going to defect, aren't you? Everybody else does. And he said, no, I'm, I'm not defecting. I'm going back to Cuba. You're here on a visitor's visa and you're going back? I've never heard of this before. But uh, he said, no, I've, I've got my family there. I'm only coming to do a series of things and I'm going back home. I said, how quaint. And as we were working... He said, you know, there's something that troubles me about this country. I said, yeah, what is it? He says, when you go to the store, how do you decide? How do you decide what you're going to get? There is so much in your supermarkets, in any store. How do you people make decisions? Now, this was a real conundrum for him. This was a real challenge uh, because in his context, you go to get bread, there's one kind of bread. You know, you go to get milk, there's one kind of milk. Have you looked at the supermarket shelves? We are so used to choices that we don't realize how many brands and sizes and types of the things uh, that we want that are at the supermarket. There's one toothpaste company that makes 33 different types of toothpastes. That's just one company. There are others. Uh, how many kinds of rice can you find in the store? You, you say rice, you think rice is rice. Are we talking long grain rice? Are we talking brown rice? Are we talking basmati? Or, you know, send your kid to the store and say, get me a bag of rice. And you're, you're really challenging the kid. Well, I don't know if anybody sends kids to the store anymore. They used to in my day. But um, you really have a challenge. If you just give somebody instruction, go get me a bag of rice. Do you want a two-pound bag, a five-pound bag, a 20-pound bag? Do you, what brand do you want? Uh, go look for peanut butter on the store shelf. You've got so many options to choose from. Here's the thing. We all have to make 
make decisions. We all have to make decisions. In the book of Joshua, as we close out our studies in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, Joshua is giving his farewell address to the people. He's an older man. Uh, there was once upon a time he was standing by the tent of meetings and, and uh, Moses was in charge and he was referred to as the young man Joshua. But now he's up in the three figures. He, he, he would make our uh, young at heart group really look young because he's in excess of 100 years old now. And uh, he's giving his farewell address and he challenges the congregation with this. Joshua 24, 14, he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is saying to the people, you've got some choices you've got to make. I'm moving on. I don't know how much longer I've got, but I'm moving on. But it's time for you to decide. You've got to determine what you're going to do with your life. I advise you to serve the Lord, but if, if you choose and not to serve Yahweh, you decide who you're going to serve. We've got decisions and that we've got to make. Decisions are unavoidable. You cannot escape them. To not decide is to decide. This morning when you got up, you had to decide. Hopefully you decided last night what clothes to wear, etc. You had to decide what food in your vast pantry or cupboard you were going to consume before coming to church. You had to decide on the time of worship where you were going to attend, whether it was going to be the 9 a.m. or 11.30. You had to decide how you drove, how you maneuvered in traffic. Do you cut the person off? Do you punch the gas? Or you, do you let the person go ahead of you? You have to decide how you spend your money, and that's a decision you have to make quite frequently. Considering how many decisions we make every day, considering how many important decisions come our way, it seems that we probably should know how to make good decisions, don't you think? Folks, this is important because every decision we make has a consequence. If you go back to Genesis chapter 4, there's a story there about Cain and Abel and uh, they both offered sacrifices, and God recognized the sacrifice of Abel, but he did not recognize the sacrifice of Cain. And Cain started to get hot about it, and God approached Cain and, and said to him, Why are you angry? Genesis 4, 6. Why are you angry, and why is your countenance falling? If you do well. See, do you get the condition here? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door and it desires for you, but you should rule over it. My friend, we have to pay attention to the decisions we make because our decisions have consequences. If you do well, says the Lord, will you not be accepted? Now, not all consequences are equal. In the case of Cain and Abel, uh, the younger brother who made the right decision lost his life over Cain's poor decision. We, but we live with our decisions. We live with our decisions nonetheless. So we need to be careful how we make them. Too often we experience difficulties because we fail to consider the consequences of our choices. You know somebody who's living in pain or who's disrupting their lives or maybe disrupting your life because of poor decisions that they're making. The question today is how do we make good decisions? How do we make good decisions? Now we could probably do a seven point or 12 point, 15 point series on making good decisions, but you know I'm gonna give you how many? Three, so let's go for it. First of all, consider what has brought about the point of decision. 
Consider what has brought about the points of decision. Life does not happen in a vacuum. You didn't just pop up to this decision moment. You came to it gradually. What brought this about? What circumstances were there? What events transpired that got you here? It's important to understand that because it affects the decision you're going to make. In the case of Joshua, in chapter 24, God had led them 40 years through the wilderness. The people had come into the land. They had taken much of the land, though not all of it. They had taken much of the land. They were beginning to settle down to get comfortable, yet some of the foreign nations were still living around them. And they had to decide after Joshua's death, were they going to continue to take the land or were they going to settle down and, and make covenants with the people around them, stop fighting, and allow the foreign influences to affect them. Let's go earlier into chapter 24 there of Joshua. Consider what has brought about the point of decision. Joshua rehearsing to the children of Israel recounts their history to them. He reminds them how God had brought them every step of the way. He doesn't go back to Egypt he goes back further than uh, Jacob, further than Isaac, further than Abraham. He goes to Abraham's father, Terah, in verse 2. And uh, he talks about how God himself has been leading them. And uh, quoting God, verse 3 says, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan. Verse 4, to Isaac, and uh, I gave Jacob and Esau. Uh, verse 5, I sent Moses and Aaron, and, and I plagued Egypt. Verse, uh, uh, where am I? Verse 8, I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, he mentions uh, Balaam and Balak, but I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you. Uh, verse 12, I sent the hornets before you, which drove them out before you also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or your bow. Verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat the, of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. Why is all of this rehearsal of history necessary? Well, sometimes we have to look backwards to see forwards. Sometimes we have to look back to see what God has done so that we can figure out what's coming up forward. When, when you make an investment, uh, when you speak to, to your broker or, or you go online and make your investment, one of the first things you do is you want to see how that investment has performed in the past. Now, every, uh, every advisor, every investment instrument is going to tell you uh, that past performance does not dictate future returns. But we still look at how, how that stock or, or that, that uh, portfolio has behaved in the past because we look back to see forward sometimes. When we come to that point of decision, we need to look back to see where God has led us. We need to look back to see how God has shaped us. Uh, when, when you decide on your future education, those of you still going into school or going to school, you don't just willy-nilly pick a major for college. You look at how has God shaped me? What has God done with me? What am I good at? How has God equipped me? Then I know how to move forward. When you make career choices, so many people have ended up in jobs they just completely hate. Yeah, uh-huh. So many have jobs they just completely hate. Why? Because their jobs have nothing to do with their personalities. Their, their jobs do not match who they are. Sometimes we need to look back and see how God has shaped us, how God has formed us, how God has prepared us, and select something that is in line with what God has been doing rather than just going for the money. We look at marriage. Sometimes we need to look back in our lives 
and the other person's lives and see how God is bringing things together. Do we just go straight on impulse, straight on, on desire, straight on emotions? I would hope not. Because a few weeks in, impulses and desires and emotions change and they're kind of stuck together for a long, long time. My friends, all decisions that we make are emotional, so we need to look back and see how God has led us. Understanding what God has been doing in our lives helps give us clarity about what sh we should be doing with our lives. Let me say that again. Understanding what God has been doing in our lives helps give us clarity about what we should be doing with our lives. So that's number one. Consider what has brought us to the point of this decision. Number two, consider the emotional basis for the decision. All decisions are emotional. Every decision, everything you've purchased, you've purchased on emotion. Now, we use reason to justify our emotion. That's what we do. We use logic to justify it, but the decision to purchase was emotional. And there are two main motivating emotions for all decisions. Two main motivating emotions. What are they? Can you guess? Faith? You're really close. It's really close to, to one of the two. Fear, for sure. Fear is an underlying motivating emotion. There are companies that will sell you services based strictly on fear. Without fear, no home security system would ever sell. Let's face it. If you were not afraid of somebody coming into your house and taking all your stuff, you would never invest in a home security system. Without fear, insurance doesn't sell. All right? You need fear to motivate you to do certain things. What's the other emotion? Close, really close to faith, same street, hope. Yes, somebody was here for a service. Yeah. Fear and hope. Now, faith is very close to hope. In fact, they're, they're, they're almost Siamese twins. Fear and hope. Now, everybody knows the difference between faith and fear, right? You do, because we've said it here a few times. I'm, I'm going to start. You finish this, right? Faith and fear are identical. You finish it. Okay, let me try it again. Faith and fear are identical because... Okay, we're going to get this because one day we're going to sing this in, as a chorus. Faith and fear are identical because they both believe what you cannot see will happen to you. Think about it. Faith and fear are identical. They both believe what you cannot see will happen to you. Think about how much energy you used up being afraid the last time you were afraid. That same amount of energy you could have used towards faith. It takes the same amount of energy to be scared as it does to be faithful. It's just a switch you have to uh, switch up in your mind. I recall earlier in my pastoral ministry, I was deadly afraid of preaching. Can you believe that? I mean, I, before the sermon started, I was nervous, I was scared, I was anxious, uh, I, I was shaking. Every time, I mean, this was going on for like three or four years. My first three, four years in, in ministry, I was afraid right before preaching, and then one day it kind of hit me. All this energy that I'm expending, exp uh, being afraid, I could put into the sermon rather than just being afraid and holding back. Eventually, I stopped being afraid. Faith and fear are identical. They both believe something you can't see right now is going to happen to you. The question is, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? The difference between hope and faith 
correction. Let me go with hope and fear here. Uh, fear is the negative expectation. Hope is the positive expectation. Fear is based on a person's negative outlook on the future. Hope is based on a person's positive outlook on the future. Now, let's kick faith into the equation, and faith is based on God's outlook on the future. What's interesting, folks, is that the motivating emotion has more to do with the outcome of your decision than the decision itself. The motivating emotion, the emotion behind the decision has more to do with the outcome than the decision itself. You can make the right decision with the wrong motivation and end up with the wrong result. Why? Motivation outlives the action. The emotion outlives the decision. Make the right decision for the wrong reason. Guess what? After the decision is made, that wrong motivation still lingers and it affects future decisions, which will ultimately cause the thing you fear to take place. Fear-based decisions bring about the reality feared. Hope-based decisions bring about the conditions of the realities hoped for. But faith-based decisions bring about the reality God has promised. Are we hopeful? Are we fearful? Or are we faithful? Are we hopeful? Are we fearful? Or are we faithful? See, if, if we're hopeful, we're going to make decisions based on what we want or what we want to see which is much better than making decisions based on what you don't want to see. When you make decisions based on what you don't want to happen, it's quite likely that's going to end up happening. It's amazing how there's a pothole this big in the road, and there's a road this big, but because you're looking at the pothole, where does your tire end up? In the pothole. That's because that's what you're focusing on. If you're focusing on fear, that's what's going to come about. But if you're focusing on the flat and smooth surface on the road, that's where you're going to end up driving. Faith-based decisions bring about the reality that God has promised. We can be hopeful or fearful, but I think it's more important for us to be faithful. Not so much focus on what we want, not so much focus on what we don't want, but focus, more importantly, on what God wants. Moses, a few years earlier, before Joshua chapter 24, Moses had his occasion to give his farewell address to the people. And Moses set the folk up, and he, he uh, read off some blessings, and he read off some curses, uh, and he said to them, choose life. But as he was speaking to them, he gave them uh, the motivating emotion. Verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 30, 20, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Moses is calling the children of Israel, love God. Let love be the motivating emotion that causes you to do the right thing. Because even the right decisions for the wrong reasons will in, in time bring about the wrong results. When making decisions, don't consider only what you fear, don't consider only what you hope for, but consider what God wants. So we've covered two points. What was the first basis for good decision making? Consider what has brought you to the point of decision. Number two, consider the emotional basis of your decision. Understand that your decision is going to be emotional. 
consider the basis for that emotion. Number three, consider love. Consider the love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we all know that is the love chapter. Paul is writing to the church and love is kind and all these things. And he wraps it up in verse 13. And he says, what? Now abide faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is? The greatest of these is love. Now the question is, what is love? Love is a nice sounding word that gets mixed up and messed up depending who explains it to you. And, and sometimes when we think we've experienced love and, and we end up getting messed up, we wonder what, what really is love? I suggest to you that love is to act, to serve, or to do what is in the best interest of that party or object that you love. It is to do what is in the best interest of the object of that love. If you love your spouse, you don't do what is in your best interest. You do what is in the spouse's best interest. If you love your car, you do what is in the best interest of that car. I've seen some people treat cars much nicer than they treat people. I've seen some people use the expensive oil, the expensive waxes, the expensive additives, additives, the expensive tires. Just keep that car running. If you love your children, you do what is in the best interest of your children. Now, children get interesting because... What is in their best interest is not always what they want. You remember being a kid? Uh-huh. And your parents telling you to eat the vegetables? Uh-huh. And, and the headaches it caused both you and them? My friends, people all, don't always want what is in their best interest. But love says you act in the best interest of the other party. Jesus was asked by a lawyer, what's the greatest commandment, Matthew 22? What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That is the greatest commandment. Love who? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Above all else, love the Lord. Above all else, love the Lord. Now, the second is just as important. It says what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it really helps if you love yourself. It does. I'm sorry. There are a lot of Christians that have problems loving themselves. They feel that it's a sin to love yourself. Well, if God made you, you probably should love you. If God made you, you probably should do what's in your best interest. Now, keep in mind what we just said. Sometimes we don't want what's in our best interest. But if we really loved ourselves, we would do what's in our best interest. If we really loved ourselves, we probably wouldn't eat that fifth plate of food. Right? Maybe if we had a little more love, we wouldn't eat the fourth plate. Maybe even the third plate. Let's not push it, okay? But that's where we said. If we loved ourselves, we would take care of ourselves. If we loved ourselves, we, we would make sure that we're doing what is in our best long-term interest. Jesus says, love your neighbors as yourself. There's two questions we must ask ourselves as we make decisions and we consider the love factor. Number one, whom does our decision indicate that we love? Whom does our decision indicate that we love? There are some times, there are some times my wife will ask me to get something. And I am totally not in the mood. The news is on, I'm on the couch, and I really, 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 really want to be right there. And unless I think about this, unless I think about the concept, that's where I stay. 
But every so often I'm reminded that our decisions reflect who we love. And every so often, you know, she gets lucky and it crosses my mind and, yeah. Yeah. And I disturb my comfort just to show some love. Now, 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 you men know how we are, right? So we do, and it's like, I want you to know I did it because I love you, right? <laughs> Let's face it. Love demonstrates who we love, or should I say the decisions we make demonstrate who we love. Second question we should ask, does our decision reflect love or does it reflect self-indulgence? Does our decision reflect love or does our decision reflect self-indulgence? There is a difference. There is a difference. We live in a self-indulged world. Everything is about me, 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 my, my, mine, I, I, I. But love is not about that. Love is about the greater good. Because the decision I make reflects what's in the best interest of others, what's in the best interest of God, what is in my best interest, or does it simply reflect what I want? We need to be mindful of this when we make decisions. Uh, let's make decisions that reflect love. Let's make re decisions that reflect faith. Let's make decisions uh, that consider what is in the best interest of all parties involved. We've got decisions we all have to make. As you think about your life, as, as you think about even Joshua chapter 24, whom you will serve, you've got a decision to make. Do we serve ourselves? Do we leave this place today and go and serve ourselves? Uh, do we leave this place and live for ourselves? Or do we live for what God wants? Do we, cho do we choose to be self-indulgent? Or do we choose to love our God? Joshua challenged the people and asked them, choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, folks, if you make the right decision, I want you to know there's good news because our decisions outlive us. Make the right decision, and the benefit of that decision will live longer than we will. Uh, 24, verse 29 and now it came to pass after these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died being 110 years old. Verse 31, Israel served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of Yahweh which he had done in Israel. When we make good decisions, my friends, others benefit flip side is true. When we make poor decisions, others suffer. Moses in his farewell sermon said to the people, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love Yahweh your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to them. What was Moses' advice? Choose life. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My appeal to you today is you decide.